Okay, it's a. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Can ever, can anybody hear me? There we go. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a little after ten o'clock, and uh, I'd like to get our meeting started. Uh, at this time, I'll call to order the uh, the meeting of the 2021 House Study Committee on Annexation and Cityhood, as authorized by House Resolution 222. Uh, this committee was. Uh, uh, Again, it was uh, the result of a resolution the House unanimously passed this year to, to review primarily the uh, procedures around annexation dispute resolution. And then we're also gonna have uh, one meeting where we, we kind of take a deep dive into some cityhood issues. This morning is our first meeting. So I welcome everybody. I appreciate you all braving the elements to get here and, uh, and hope you all have safe travels going back home because it's not gonna get much better as I understand. But uh, uh, we, uh, we have, uh, most of you may have, if you don't have it, uh, it's available on our website, but we have the agenda today. Uh, I'm calling the meeting, meeting to order now, and we'll go ahead and uh, uh, get, <clears throat> get into the context of our meeting. Uh, our committee is authorized for five meetings. We have kind of segregated those five meetings out by subject matter, if you will. This is our first meeting. It's, uh, it's gonna be a lot of information gathering to allow us, the members of the board, or the, the uh, committee to, uh, to kind of come up to speed on some things that we may not understand or know up to this point. Uh, real quick, I'd like to just introduce the members of the board in case any of you, uh, or the study committee is, in case any of you uh, aren't familiar with us, to my far right over here is Representative uh, Rob Levert from District 33. My immediate right is Chairwoman Darlene Taylor from District 173. Uh, I, of course, am Victor Anderson uh, from District 10, Northeast Georgia. Then to my left over here is Brad Thomas, uh, Representative Brad Thomas from District 21. And in front of us here is Chairwoman Mar Mary Margaret Oliver from District 82. Uh, in 2007, the state legislature passed a bill that uh, authorized or created uh, the annexation dispute resolution policies that are in place now and utilized. And that particular portion of our code has not been, it, it's been looked at, but it hasn't been reviewed in detail for, for possible improvements since. There have been some, uh, some study committees in 2015, both on the House and the Senate side, to look at annexation and some cityhood issues. Uh, there were a few adjustments made in general in 2015, but for the most part, the result of those study committees is that uh, uh, it's a broad subject, a little too much for a five uh, meeting study committee. That's the reason we've kind of dialed down the focus of this committee to dispute resolution and those policies and procedures. So uh, uh, I hope that's what uh, all of our presenters are here prepared to, to uh, speak to. If not, you may want to adjust your, uh, your agenda a little bit there. But uh, with that said, I'd like to uh, call our first uh, presenter today, Mr. Rusty Haygood from uh, Department of Community Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here uh, this morning. Uh, Department of Community Affairs is tasked with a couple of things that are related to annexation. The one that says push, is, is it on now? Okay, thank you. Uh, the Department of Community Affairs is tasked with a couple of pieces of annexation uh, statute as it pertains to uh, how the process works. Uh, the first is, is going to be um, the reporting of annexations to the department. Uh, the second is going to be uh, handling the arbitration process, getting that ball rolling so that uh, a process can be in place for cities and counties uh, to work through those challenges that may be associated with a specific annexation. Um, I'd like to walk just uh, for a few moments through the process of how annexations occur and uh, how that comes to DCA, how the objections occur, because that's the first piece of this uh, arbitration process. So um, a, a city decides that they are intending to annex some property and they give notification to the county of that uh, pending action. And as a result of that, the city has, a, uh, excuse me, the county has a couple of options. They can uh, accept that and, and understand that that's a, a process to move forward, or they can object. And uh, there are timelines that are spelled out within the statute. Um, if the county objects, 
statutorily, they are obligated to notify the city within 30 days um, that they intend to object to this annexation. And it starts the process. What you find next in code is that DCA has 15 days from that notification in which to impanel a group to uh, review this annexation. There's a piece that's missing though. The piece that's missing is notification of DCA. If we find out on day 14, we are still statutorily charged to impanel by day 15 because it's tied back to the city notification, not when DCA uh, receives notification of that. It's proved challenging in a couple of occasions where we didn't find out until late in the process. That's no fault of anybody's uh, in that it, it's not uh, something that we think the counties are trying to subvert. If, if you're a county and you read the statute, it says notify the city and they do that. And uh, I would just uh, ask of you to consider adding one more piece of the puzzle, notification of DCA in this process. Uh, statute prescribes exactly how those notifications can be uh, given. It's overnight mail or, or certified mail. And um, those are the only two options. It, it's a shall, it's not a should or may or anything like that. Those are the two mechanisms for uh, notification there. Um, whether or not the legislature thinks anything else should be considered, that's, that's for y'all to consider, but it is limited to those two forms. So DCA uh, gets notification that we, uh, we have an objection that we have to deal with through the annexation arbitration process. We begin the process to identify individuals from a list that we have. Um, we've got county officials, we've got city officials, and we've got academics as it's called for in the statute. What we do is we pull four names at random from the city list, four names at random from the county list, and three names from the academic list. We present those to the city and the county uh, in question. The county gets to strike two city names and one academic. And the opposite is true as well. So we whittle it down to two city representatives, two county representatives, and an academic. That panel of five is your arbitration panel. Um, within the, the statute, uh, it says that individuals really shouldn't serve more than twice a year. That has proven a little more challenging in recent days, as we've seen the number of annexation, uh, um, excuse me, the objections increase and, and us having to increase the number of panels uh, that have been asked for. Uh, I'll give you a few numbers in, in just a moment, but um, as we try to do that, we are uh, tasked with completing that in 15 days. It, it does get a little challenging during holidays, during summer vacations and things like that to try to, to get uh, commitments from individuals that they are able to serve and then put that out to the cities and counties. But um, we, we've worked through that process. As of right now, our team has told me that on the list of potential panelists, we've got 16 city individuals, 24 county individuals, because we just added seven, I believe, and 16 academics. Year to date in 2021, we have been requested to field 13 arbitration panels already. So if we've got two members from the cities and the county, uh, we're getting close to, to tapping out two per. Um, but again, we, we have to uh, put names out for the, the strike. So it's not a, a guaranteed everybody's gonna serve two there. So um, the, the number uh, of individuals on the panel, uh, on the list of potential panelists is, um, something that we would love to see increased as, as we move forward, just to account for uh, this increased number of annexations. Uh, over the last couple of years, we have gone from two arbitration panels called for in 2017 to 13 year to date. Um, that's, that's a significant increase. And uh, I don't know exactly what to attribute that to, but uh, it is a trend that we're seeing. We saw seven last year for the year before. So to, to go up uh, exponentially in the last couple of years is definitely uh, an indication that something is going on as far as uh, a desire for objections in the process and uh, it, it creates additional uh, steps for us to, to take as we uh, implement the statute that's, uh, that we're charged to do. Um, that's really the, the process from a DCA perspective. Um, at the end of the process, uh, we ask that the panel notify us of what the, the recommendations, what their findings, what they concluded. 
Um, sometimes we get it, sometimes we don't. And that's challenging. We, we try our best to track it down, um, but it, it's, it's one of the things that um, we, we do struggle with in, in receiving the, uh, the final action of this panel. So that's the, the last thing that I would point out to the committee that we, we struggle with. And that's uh, just a product of, of not receiving the report or, or whatever the conclusion of that panel would have been. Mr. Chairman, uh, that's the process in a nutshell. I'm, I'm happy to entertain questions that you may have. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Haygood. Uh, do uh, the members of the committee have any questions? Yes. Chairwoman. Chairwoman. I'm sorry, Chairwoman no. Oliver, I, I apologize. No, the no, first no, one that flashed. Was... Thank you very much. Uh, you had a gentleman who was kind of managing your annexation disputes who was left. You did an excellent job. Yeah. Uh, congratulations to him. There was legislation introduced last year that required individuals seeking cities seeking uh, annexations to disclose tax abatement issues. Um, there is no law right now, is there, that requires anybody to disclose tax abatements if they're proposing an annexation? Am I correct on that? I'm not aware of any. Um, did the department last year take a position for or against that notification? No, ma'am. Um, there were a couple of other procedural issues set forth in some legislation, and I'm sure y'all reviewed those procedural. If the state were to give you money for those in couple of enhanced procedures. Would y'all object to implementing those? No, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, now, Chairwoman Taylor. Thank you. Um, you actually asked a couple of the questions I was concerned about, but I, one additional would be, um, what are the issues that you are seeing that are the strongest or get the most objections? Do you have some idea? There are three, um, criteria that an objection uh, may follow in order to be valid. Um, so that that is really the, those are the guardrails that are set forth and um, it, it can't be outside of those guardrails um, as, as it pertains to what the criteria or what uh, the county says is the objectionable activity. Would you share those? Yes, ma'am. I don't want to uh, misspeak on those. So I'm going to, uh, Call those up, I apologize. Um, those are um, a material increase in burden upon the county directly related to any one or more of the following. The proposed change in zoning or land use, the proposed increase in density, and infrastructure demands related to the proposed change in zoning or land use. Those, Thank are, you. The, those are the three statutorily okay. called. I just wanted them in the record. Yes, Thank you. Representative Thomas. Thank you. I actually have one question with regards to process. Uh, Chairman Taylor actually got my other question. So um, you said that the one of the issues that you have is you get notified late in the process. Um, I guess sometimes. Sometimes. Yes. Um, so to understand in that 30 day objection period by the county, mm -hmm what I'm hearing you say is the county doesn't notify you. This is actually something that's done by the city afterwards. Can you, can, can you expound on that just a little bit for me, please? It varies to be quite honest. Um, sometimes we're notified as soon as that objection goes to the city. Um, but statute doesn't call for anybody specifically to do that. And sometimes I think if, if you're not uh, well-versed in annexation processes, uh, it could be overlooked uh, to be quite honest. If uh, someone isn't uh, accustomed to, objecting, uh, they, they may go to the statute and say, we must notify the city and, and think that they've done all that's necessary. Um, and, and they followed the statute explicitly. Um, what I would say to answer the question is, uh, sometimes there's just a delay in getting to us. I don't think it's intentional in any capacity, but um, we do have a statutory 15 days that we must meet uh, in order to impanel. And um, we, we if we were able to be notified at the same time as the city, that would be extremely helpful for us to ensure that we're able to uh, impanel a group of individuals to, to hear each case. Thank you. Representative Leverett. Thank you, Chairman. 
Um, sorry, sorry about that. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, Ms. Ted Good. I appreciate your time this morning. I appreciate your comments. To follow up on Representative uh, Thomas's uh, question, I, I think you actually said in your testimony that adding a statutory requirement of some form of notice to DCA at the time the objection is lodged would aid you in performing your duties as an agency. Yes, sir. Significantly. Okay. Well, um, I, you know, as usual as a legislator, I don't have any original thoughts. So I, I would you would you prefer notice like paper notice by certified mail overnight uh, or electronic or is there a particular mechanism that would be more suitable for the department's purposes? Um, we would not have a preferred mechanism uh, to be quite candid. Um, receiving it in the same fashion that the city does would be absolutely sufficient for us. Um, just the notification would be the most important piece of that. I I would think that since the county is the first one to know about the objection and they notified the city, just simply requiring a duplication or a copy of that be sent to DCA would probably be an efficient way to, to handle that. Seems efficient and, and completely uh, within the realm of possibility. Is there any particular division or department that should be specified when the notice is sent to make sure it gets to the person that needs to get to? Sure. It would be DCA's Office of Planning. Okay. Do you, does DCA currently, to, to follow up on Chairman Taylor's question, do you maintain any kind of database about the type of objection of those three statutory criteria? We, we have a list of, of what is objected, um, but that's not something that's an outwardly facing, it's an internal document at this point. Okay, okay. I, I just, I mean, I know you got enough to do already, so we don't need to add anything else to you unless there's a really good reason. But do you see, would there be any advantage to maintaining some kind of uh, record or database as to the basis of the objections? Because I'm assuming you do keep a record of, because you quoted some figures here today of how many of these, uh, not necessarily of how many annexations, I don't know, but at least of, right. of the, uh, of, of the arbitrations yes. being invoked. Um, any, I, you know, other people would have to weigh in if they would like to see that sort of thing compiled, but just from your perspective as an agency, would it help you at all in fulfilling your duties to maintain some kind of record of that? Um, internally, we have the record. Uh, okay. So I, I think for our agency purposes, uh, that's sufficient. If there is another purpose, then uh, happy to discuss that. And I'm assuming that that information is a public record would be obtainable either yes. through a request or public record. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, sir. Mr. Taggart, I had just had one question. This is something you'd actually mentioned in your presentation that didn't get picked up when we were talking about notifications, and that is on the other end of the process, uh, the notification of the findings of the uh, arbitration panel. Correct. Right. Uh, is kind of following along those lines. Is that something that would be beneficial to for us to codify so that it is a requirement that that be done? It would be tremendously beneficial to the agency. Okay. All right. And I think Representative Thomas has an additional question. Is the findings from that arbitration panel legally binding? Uh, yes. There, there are components of that that are absolutely binding. When you say components, what does that mean? Um, Again, I, I would like to cite it exactly uh, so that I don't uh, misspeak for you. Um, if the decision of the panel contains zoning, land use, or density conditions, the findings and recommendations of the panel shall be recorded in the deed records of the county with a caption describing uh, the name of the current owner of the property, uh, recording reference of the current owner's acquisition deed, and a general description of the property, and plainly showing the expiration date of any restrictions or conditions. Um, we we see the the panel potentially doing uh, those types of conditions associated with the um, annexations and um, so. Be, go ahead. No, you please. Uh, it, it could. Uh, provide restrictions on what type of zoning or land use actions may occur in the future. So is that a typical um, 
result from the annexation process or is it more of a black and white because I, what i'm hearing is sometimes it could come out and be a little bit more of a shade of gray where sometimes you get a little bit more of this or a little bit more of that i would say it, it completely varies because sometimes the uh, panel is called together and before they really get into the process a city and a county have come to agreement mm -hmm. on a resolution to this so it, it doesn't even go through that that process in but, the end but when it does um is it it how often, I guess, I guess my question to rephrase it is how often do you see, a, I guess, a compromise and come out of the... Compromises are common. Uh, I, can't, I can't really quantify that. Going back to the chairman's question just a moment ago, we don't mm -hmm. see every resolution. Okay. And um, without seeing every resolution, I would I hate to, to try to spitball numbers okay. on the spot. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, Representative Lever. To, to follow up on Representative Thomas's point, would it also help you to have some statutory mandate of a decision or a resolution be provided to you, to your department? Um, I, I'm not sure I, I see the distinction between that and the, the panel Well, it, it, one thing, I and I may have just missed it in your comments, so I apologize if I no. just if that slipped by me. Um, you had indicated in your testimony that you don't always receive a copy of a final, I guess it's for lack of a better word, I would call it a decision by the arbitration panel. Yes. So once they rule, they sometimes, which just blows my mind that they forget to tell the entity that created them what they did, right. but apparently that happens. So as Victor asked, I think it would be, it makes perfectly good sense to me for you to be provided a copy of that. So you maintain a record yes. of it, first of all, because I think that'd be very useful. Sure. Secondly, if if it sounds like you also were saying that sometimes if the panel gets appointed and the city and county end up coming to an agreement, there's no requirement that they tell you we've agreed to something and here's what it is. That would be correct. Okay. And and did I understand you to say it would be it would certainly be helpful if you could at least get that notice so you could tell the panel they can all go home. Correct. But secondly, it might be useful for you to get a a copy of the decision just so you can keep your file or, or even if it's not a i'm sorry not a decision of, of the of the agreement resolving right. the dispute or at least notice that it has been resolved yes okay mr chairman if i may go back uh to representative thomas's question um my team blew up my cell phone the the findings are binding for one calendar year yes i didn't add that important point thank you yes thank you for clarity yes any other uh, questions, comments uh, on the part of the committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you, sir. Appreciate sure, your you. uh, coming out and talking to us today. Next on our agenda, uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Bob Weatherford to come forward and uh, address the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ready? Oh. Oh. Yes, proceed. Thank you. I also have copies of a uh, summary of what I'm going to give you today. So if you want to have that for your own records, that would be uh, uh, here for you. Just to uh, give you a little background, um, I've been a panelist uh, for DCA since 2008 uh, in arbitration. Uh, I've served on 12 panels over that time, and I was elected chair each time for some reason. And with chairmanship comes a lot of responsibilities. Um, I served six years as a city representative because I was the mayor pro tem of Ackworth for those times. And then the last six, I served as a county representative since I was Cobb County Commissioner as well. So I'm a hybrid and I've seen both sides. Um, I've been on both GMA and ACCD boards uh, over the years and uh, have been certified as a county commissioner as well as a certificate of ev ev uh, excellence from uh, Carl Vincent Institute of Government. And I wanted to go through some of the things I see not from the technicalities of the statute which I'm sure ACCG and GMA will go over in detail, but from a panelist point of view, some of the issues that, that I've run into over the years. Uh, the first uh, process is that 
the statute requires that the panelists appoint a chair, they appoint a secretary to keep the notes and evidence and that that be recorded in a certain format and forwarded to the county and the city. Uh, I do not recall it ever being said to forward it to DCA. Uh, I have every one that I've served on on my computer and I forward that to the county and to the city when it's resolved. I always assumed, and obviously I made a mistake, that they forwarded it to DCA. I think a simple adjustment to the statute says that you copy DCA when you send the findings to the county and the city would solve the issue that DCA has. And I apologize, I never knew that I needed to do that. Uh, I don't recall seeing that anywhere uh, in the panelists. Uh, so I think it would be prudent that the statute be changed that the entities provide a court reporter because we're elected officials, not court reporters. And some of these uh, panels, arbitration panels get quite extensive, especially in the larger counties, and they've gone as long as three days and mountains of evidence. So it's run just like a trial, just like if those of you that have done those as elected official in the city or county where you do a, a hearing, an a hearing for a business license revocation or something like that. So I run it just like a trial according to the statute. Uh, again, a court reporter would be a very essential thing that I think you should provide in the statute. And the larger counties will do that for you automatically. Uh, you just don't have time as a panelist to listen to all of the presentations and the evidence and then also take notes and record. And uh, one particular one I remember, I had five books of evidence with tabs in that. So it felt more like law and order than it did an arbitration panel. Uh, the other thing is we've run into several situations here in the last couple of years where legal counsel is needed for the panelists. Uh, we reached out uh, one particular one, and I believe it was a, the city that requested that the panel uh, be dismissed because the legalese wasn't met properly. And that's been discussed about time and all that. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So I reached out to my uh, friends at, D at ACCG and GMA and said, look, I need help. I'm a chairman and I don't know what to do. And their lawyer has requested me to rule on this. And they very helpful and studied it for a while and came back and said, because of the statute, there is no ex parte communications and we can't help you. Which was very disturbing <laughs> because I'm not a lawyer. Uh, so what I ruled was, uh, I don't know if I can rule on this, so we're going to proceed and you can sue anybody later if you want to. So that's the way I proceeded. Uh, in one case, one county provided us a lawyer at the county's expense. All I'm asking is that the panelists usually don't need legal advice or legal counsel, but they certainly should be able to reach out to their counterparts at GMA and ACCG for guidance. And the statute as it stands today does not allow that, as I understand it. So that would be my request from my experience as, as the chair. And again, it's essentially run as, as a trial. And if you've not done one before, and uh, some of the participants and panelists are, I don't use this sparingly, but smaller counties, smaller cities, uh, they may have not had that experience. So I would suggest that in the training, and I honestly can't recall the training since it's been 13 years ago, there should be some mock trial so that they can understand how to run a trial, I guess, you know, defend it, you know, et cetera, enter evidence, evidence entered in. Because I guarantee you the legal teams on both sides, they know all that stuff. And it, it does get somewhat overwhelming. Uh, the second topic, uh, that's kind of the process from a practical standpoint, but the second topic is timelines. I'm gonna leave that to ACC and GMA and that's all been discussed at length, but as a county commissioner, I do recall numerous times where we had sometimes less than five days to respond to an annexation request and decide if we we're going to uh, approve it or not approve it. You have to remember that city councils and county commissioners do not meet 
every week. They meet at best every other week and sometimes once a month. So if they get that on timing on a Friday and they, they don't, they just met, it could be 30 days or, or 14 days before they can get together to decide whether or not to object to an annexation request. I think that timeline needs to be worked out so it's much more reasonable and give both entities uh, time to thoroughly take a look at an, uh, an annexation request. But again, uh, I had several issues with that as a county commissioner in that I had five days and then I had to find other commissioners and talk to them ex parte or whatever and and try to figure out if if i could get if i could count to three <laughs> so i think if you broaden that and i think uh, i know acc todd is going to go through that that definitely needs to be changed and the method probably emails to me are perfectly fine and it's the main communications but if you have to overnight it or send it or those things that again adds additional time and expense. So from the timeline standpoint, I'm sure both uh, entities will discuss that later. Uh, as far as the findings are concerned, it's pretty straightforward in the handout of the statute, what you have to answer and not answer. And as the chairman, you have to respond and fill those in and fill out the summary of the panel and their findings. Uh, as the commissioner from DCA mentioned is, he said, um, Mr. Hey, hey good. Um, there is only a limitation or you can only oppose a one year zoning restriction. And along that line, I'll give you a quick story. I had a county and a city that were uh, in a dispute. And if I recall, it was a, 100 acre track that was rural residential and they were going to do light industrial along the interstate and, and they were going to uh, and the county was objecting because it was rural residential in nature and they were going to put light industrial a lot of truck traffic, etc, cetera, etc, cetera. and there were county roads and the city was going to take over some of the roads and provide sewer and water since the, I don't think the county had it or I forgot which was which. And it was going uh, fairly good and quite honestly it appeared that most people were leaning toward the county because the city was trying to do something that was out of character for the neighborhood and then the city council met and decided to add a rural residential zoning to their zoning laws and they annexed that as rural residential which by the way took away everything we there was no objection because it was sane but since it was an industrial park they were putting in, I believe they knew it was going to take longer than a year to develop and that as soon as the year was up, they could do whatever they wanted to with it. So I don't think that's the intention of the statute. So along that, my findings were there needs to be more teeth into the process. If you're going to go to the trouble to impanel essentially uh, elected officials from all entities, uh, you need to give them more teeth so that they can make it viable. And I'm not exactly sure all that was, but I would say uh, three years or more would be a, a, good, a good number. And I know both ACG and GMA may talk about that probably in various sides of the issue. Um, and allow down zonings as well. It's unclear. We have put, I believe, Representative Thomas asked questions about whether or not we, you know, we did zonings. We usually do a zoning requirement. It will be zoned such and such and such and such. Typically, it's either what they requested or, or what we denied. It would be nice if this particular example, if I said, yes, you can have light, you can't have light industrial, you can have rural residential or LRO, low rods office, or something other than that. And that will be in effect for three years. And that gives it a lot more teeth to the panel. The other issue is part of the time on a panel, you need to figure out what their zoning is because everyone has something different. And uh, LRO, low rods office, or light industrial may not mean the same in Monroe County as it does in Cobb County. And uh, R30 versus R3. Uh, these are things you learn as an elected official 
and uh, you know so sometimes that becomes a little stumbling block so i would suggest that you revisit what the panels uh, i guess uh, requirements are when they do a ruling that we allow longer than one year and you allow some latitude in the zoning uh, that you can change it to what you really think it is. But if you go through what the statute reads, you're very limited to certain things you can respond to. And as the chair, uh, the deputy chairman, our commissioner said from DCA, it's mainly infrastructure, uh, zoning, and also um, a burden, financial burden. And those things are sometimes hard to quantify. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I think in the statute, it needs to clarify, and I've only had one instance of this, where typically a city council and a county commission have met and discussed this, pro this dispute. And I don't know whether they vote on it or not. I think that's some of the topics that ACCG certainly is going to bring up that maybe both should have already looked at this, but a lot of times neither one of them has really seen it. And because of that, um, it, it's like you're starting from scratch, like you're having a zoning hearing, not an arbitration hearing. And typically it says in the statute, if I recall, that you have to have fact witnesses, witnesses that can testify to facts. One uh, did uh, actually this year, they called the public in to speak and it basically turned into a zoning hearing. And if you've ever done a zoning hearing, it's more emotional and it is factual. And so then all of a sudden you tried, to, I tried to say, this is not who's supposed to be testifying. It's supposed to be your engineer or your economic development director, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, your county or city manager. So I think it needs to be clear. And I believe it is, it's just that I, didn't seem to have enough teeth to stop it, that it needs to be factual witnesses, not a zoning hearing, if, if that makes any sense. And I'm just telling you some of the experiences that, um, that I've run into. So in summary, in, in the 12 so years and the 12 panels that I've been on, I would say the majority of it is a political issue that, that's, as opposed to a zoning issue at times, some someone objected in the county or the neighbors or whatever, and they go through this process. And a lot of times, I think several times, it's been resolved during the process uh, that. I think a lot of this could be resolved if, in most counties and cities do this, that there's a cooperative um, planning and service delivery strategy agreements between the city and the county. And I believe DCA is in charge of that process. And, and most of the time that's the case, the future land use plans and things of that nature. Uh, you run into the uh, smaller counties and cities that you run into infrastructure disputes. You have to forgive me, I'm used to Cobb County where you have cities in the city of Cobb. We get everything from Cobb as you can get from a city. But in, that's not the case in, in some counties. If you wanted water or sewer or whatever, or fire, you went to the city to do that. So there are issues there, and that brings up a lot more infrastructure needs than, than it would be in a county that's a metropolitan county. The other thing I found is that it's very hard for the county and the panel to understand and quantify the dollars that are lost if this annexation goes through and they try and they do and they are very good at it but you have to read through it because a lot of times what i've found is that the dollars that are lost are really county dollars and the city residents are county residents as well so it's difficult for me to say you know you can't you're losing money when the city residents are paying county taxes as well to pay for that services or infrastructure so, and I don't really know, that's for the panel to figure that out and dissect it and see if that is. And then I guess the last thing in summary is that when I first started, it would take a couple of three hours and you drive down to Fayette County and you know they'd pay you mileage and you'd get done in two or three hours. Uh, now it's two or three days. <laughs> and 
driving a lot of places. And I don't know that I'm not trying to say I do this for the money, but I, I think you need to look at what you pay the panelists or how you pay the panelists or whatever and, and say, okay, maybe it ought to be. And I, right now it's set as legislature pay. And I don't know what legislature pay is other than what it was in 2008. And I don't think you voted yourself a raise. So it's probably the same. And so I submit expense report from all the panelists for $175 and mileage. And that's okay, except when you're done, we usually have at least another day of communications between the panelists trying to get them together to come up with a ruling. So the time you're there is not there. So you know, I might suggest that you, you take a look at uh, at least two days pay minimum, even though you're not physically on site because you're you're actually doing calls and conference calls and emails back and forth. It's just a thought. Uh, personally, I mean, I do it for free, but it's just something. If you want to get people to do this, to take time, because a lot of people have to take a day off of work, and then they have to take another half day to get the findings, or review the findings. And I've had issues with people not looking at the summary, and and I'm waiting and waiting and waiting for one panelist to say yay or nay on the finalists, and, and that causes some kind of delay. But that's kind of my experience. I apologize. It's long-winded, and hopefully uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, and uh, uh, Mr. Weatherford, and that was actually very informative. So uh, at this moment, uh, I'd like to recognize Chairwoman Oliver. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, very helpful. Yeah. House Bill 24 that's pending right now suggested adding a non-voting hearing officer to the arbitration panel. Uh, you suggested a legal counsel to the chair of the arbitration panel. Does it make a difference to you whether- No, no ma'am, <laughs> just some help. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming the hearing officer would know a little bit about hearings. <laughs> Ruling on evidence and things yes. like that. That would, that, I mean, I just said legal just because one particular case, it was a legal opinion that I couldn't get any help on. Uh, Most of the agencies have administrative law judges or hearing officers. I think DCA does too, for some purposes, but the prior discussion was who's going to pay for that. And we went back and forth as to whether the city and county would pay for the hearing officer or DCA would. In any of the hearings have you done, has there been evidence presented or disputes presented about proposed tax abatements? Yes, ma'am. Uh, various but, kinds, yes. Uh, has there ever been any reluctance of any of the parties to discuss or disclose tax abatement issues? Are, are you, well, if you're referring to that they're going to provide a tax abatement if it's annexed, uh, typically that's not brought up. The county would bring it up, the city mm -hmm. probably does well, not. But what I have learned is, it, I usually ask, is there, one of the questions is, is there a TAD or a, is there any tax abatement already existing on this property? Not, is there going to be? And I'm not sure how you could, how you could find that out or Those if are, that's even something. That's very good questions for the chair to be asking. Uh, but in terms of the reasons for agreeing or not agreeing to an annexation, the provision of tax abatements or tax benefits is not a reason on the statute right now. Correct. And typically uh, that's not one of the conditions that you can use. That could be factored into the infrastructure or the cost that goes along with the annexation. The reason I ask is if it's a, uh, a SPLOS of some kind, it's a countywide uh, transportation SPLOS, and, the, and um, if, if one entity like the county says, well, we're going to lose, the, the, well, the, the city's already been paying that as well. So I, I, I somewhat dismiss that because it's a countywide SPLOS. It's not a county SPLOS and not city SPLOS. Mm -hmm. So it has to be something that's unique to the county that would cause the county uh, financial burden if the city annexes in. And sometimes that's things in the back of their mind or in the future that you really are not privy to and they probably won't tell you anyway. Right. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Representative Thomas. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I want to begin by telling you how much I appreciate you coming down here today. Thanks. It is very nice to have an individual who's seen both sides of the coin. Um, and uh, I very much value your your input in this process. Um, it, you have to forgive me. I've got 
literally a page of notes just for probably should add to. Um, but I did miss a part. I, I noticed in your findings, you have a comment or a, a bullet point here about assessment percent should change 75%, 25%. Yeah, I forgot that. Sorry. You, you, well, I'm, I'm curious about that. So if, if you don't mind. Yeah, the way the statute reads is 75% of the cost is attributed to the county and 25% to the city. It also gives the panel the leeway to split that 25% and apportion that all to the county or all to the city or portions of that. Typically, that has not been an issue. I'm not debating where that should be 75-25. I, I really don't think it ought to be that way. It ought to be at least 50-50, you know, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, but then you get some panelists that say, well, let's, you know, uh, this was frivolous or this was, you know, anybody could see this was, shouldn't have been, you know, we have these discussions in executive session and they want to do 12 and a half percent and 12 and a half percent. So I, you know, it, it gets a little more complicated. I, I don't, I don't think it ought, you ought to be able to split whatever that percentage is based on what the panelists want to do, because it, we spend a little more time than we need to figuring out uh, one, the last one I did, I think was 12 and a half percent more to the county and 12, only the city only paid 12 and a half cents. And then they split the cost, you know, and you get a check for $5 and 42 and a half cents, you know, mm -hmm. it, it really ought to be whatever it is, is, is whatever it is. And that's the cost of doing business in my opinion. So. Thank you. Actually, I have a second question. Sure. Um, what during this dispute resolution process is there any discussion with regards to impact fees um and how those are split between the county or the city during that annexation process impact fees are illegal sir okay i didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> well no they're not they're all the time they just call them something yeah they, well <laughs> i'm sorry I'm, I'm not if i can't use the term impact no, so you, just you can't I'm, I'm just making fun of you uh, okay <laughs> no that's all right i appreciate that a little bit of hum freaking humor here's a good thing no no there's there's very little discussion unless one of the parties brings it up uh in, uh any type of fee recreational sewer or whatever is uh, goes to whatever entity owns that property. And those are after either before the annexation or after the annexation. Okay. I don't think that is mainly it's infrastructure. It's usually uh, anything doing with uh, roads, sewers, water, things of that nature. So I, I to put it, I guess, a little more correctly. Um, <laughs> so in fees with regards to um, issuing permits, um, That's you know, any, any of those type tap fees, whatever else, right. none of that is discussed. Yes, the county brings that up is their argument for denying or objecting to annexation as part of their uh, infrastructure and our financial burden. They okay. will bring that up. It would be up to the county uh, to do that. Okay. And, you know, typically it would be you know, uh, infrastructure fees such as you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And that would be part of their cost analysis that says this is what it's going to cost us if the city annex it into that. And I, I welcome that because I like I like to see that. But property taxes is not one of those mm -hmm. because they both pay property taxes. Correct. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Representative Leverett. Well, thank you for your uh, comments. I don't think you were long one at all. It was very dense. You you were covering a lot of really good topics. So I appreciate I thank appreciate you, that, and I also appreciate very much. You know, it's it's great to sit up here and draft legislation, but it's great to see how it actually works when it hits the real world. Right. <laughs> so um, so it's it's real good to to sort of get that front line um yep. you know report back. So um, you had mentioned. And, I, and I'm sorry, I was trying to take notes and I was looking at the statute. And so I, I think I missed the gist of where you were headed. But you, you, at one point you were talking about how every jurisdiction zoning is really different. There's no statewide standard for zoning. Correct. And, and that's not something I think we could ever do. Um, and, and so was your point there that that just tends to increase the amount of time? Or is there not currently something in the statute that requires the parties to explain to you what the zoning, uh, you know, ca classifications and categories are in their respective jurisdictions that might be helpful for you to make a decision? That's a good question, Representative Leverett. Uh, the, the, I have some experience in that area. 
I guess what I'm saying is maybe someone else does not. And one of the things you need to do is, and I do that is I try to understand what they are so I can compare apples to apples. Right. Uh, usually it's brought up in the uh, oral arguments or the presentations and the back witnesses. But I, all I was simply trying to say was it makes it difficult. And one of the things you have to ascertain as a panelist is, okay, they're saying in the city, they're saying LI and the county saying you know, LMI or something like that. So you have to work that out. I don't think there's any reason to, to add that into the statute. I just wanted to, you to understand that it's, it's a little more complicated than just listening to fact witnesses. You have to ascertain the two. And I think most everyone I've been on, both sides have been very adept in, in, in defining the issue between that, those, those so, codes. So do you find the parties usually do a pretty good job of at least, you know, putting into evidence their zoning ordinance and trying to describe what their ordinance is, at least, at least what the relevant categories in that dispute are. Correct. Yes. Sir. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. I apologize if I confused anybody. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it was only me, but I just, I want to make sure. Um, do, um, did I also understand you to be urging that we broaden or expand the scope of the bases of the objections that are provided in the statute? Do you feel like they're too narrow? I think that uh, there's been uh, several instances where the panel felt like if they could do this, then they would rule differently or change differently. So I think that if who could do, if the objection criteria were were, were more uh, broad, yes. So do you feel there's some valid basis of an objection that they can't, that counties can't raise under the current statute? Correct. Okay. Um, and, and, and I'm not exactly, I mean, I think our legal team from both ACC and GMA would be the ones to say what those should be or okay. not be. Right. But I'm just saying a lot of times I've, we've had discussions that said, well, I don't think this is this or that and i'm going okay but we got to go through these five things and that's all we can answer right uh, i try to put in there things and that there's a summary section and typically what i do is i request that the city if the annexation goes through meet with all the surrounding neighbors that are in the county and allow them to know what's going on and put that in there but it really has no teeth well, and that, that was another topic you meant, you made that you feel like a lot of people are seeing this for the first time sometimes in the hearing. Could Correct. you, I, I didn't quite understand what you meant by that. And again, I probably was getting distracted and didn't hear the entire comment. There's in the statute, there's the states that there should be a pre-hearing. And of the 12 times that I've done this, I can only recall maybe three that had pre-hearings. Uh, most time when you get there and, and a lot of times they will send you the material to review and that's probably been in the major, you know majority of the time but sometimes there's a pre-hearing uh, that needs to occur we did it last year zooms and stuff like that but when people come in and remember the panelists are coming from all of the states so some are from south georgia north georgia some are metro areas some are in metro area going to south georgia and, you know, you drive for three or four hours or five hours, you get there and then all of a sudden they put this big book in front of you and they say, okay, elect a chair, elect a secretary and let's go. And you're going, well, wait, 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 wait a minute. I would like to have known what we're even talking about other than this one road versus one road annexation dispute. It, there's really not, I think it ought to be a requirement that the panelists receive at least a summary of what the objection is about and the salient points that go along with it. Like we call that a pretrial brief in, in most court cases. And it's, yeah, that's why I need a hearing. Opinion. That's why I need a hearing officer. So. <laughs> well, and I think the, and that's a good point. I think the reason for that is so you're not just showing up cold. You got a little bit of knowledge about what the underlying dispute Correct. is. So you're more effective and your time is, can be more effectively used. And you know, the, the Metro County and the larger counties, that not an issue, but some of the, uh, outlying counties that maybe haven't done it. And it's not their fault. It just ought to be spelled out that, hey, this needs to happen, I would think. And, and really, I, you know, I've had an overnight case of books before. I, I don't want that just yet. I, what I want that is on my 
desk when I get there, but I want a summary of what those books say. Yes. So at least have an idea. And we've done, we've also done uh, road trips. I mean, we've asked, we've left and gone and looked at the property and looked at the road uh, because if I think that's, if it's, you know, contested and it's disputed and there's a lot of controversy, then it's the panel I've taken them on a couple of road trips. I said, let's go look at it. And when you go look at it, things change. It's a lot different than paper. Do you, you receive all the evidence in open session. Do you, del, do you generally try to make a decision there or do you adjourn and then communicate by phone? And, it, and yeah, I believe it written? gives us, and correct me if I'm wrong, three days or something like that to make a decision. Depending on what time we get through with the hearing, if it's uh, noonish or oneish or twoish, then we'll adjourn and try to resolve it in a, uh, they set up an executive conference room and we do go in the uh, executive session and we try to get that resolved. One I did, we got done at four and we went in there and tried for an hour and, and it didn't, you know, we didn't quite get it done. And then everybody goes back to their respective corners. And then that's when it gets hard to get them back together to rule it. And I put together and take notes as a chairman and, and, and any chairman, not just me, but any chairman takes notes, puts together and fills out the form according to the statute. And then I email it to everyone. And then I expect them to respond to me in a timely manner because the county and the city are expecting me to respond in a timely manner. And sometimes that's, it falls down there a little bit, but usually I've never had one take more than three days to get the summary done and then i send it to the county and the city attorneys and that's again where according to dca i've fallen down i should send it to dca as well but it's never been a requirement so is there is there like a form of opinion or decision that you complete and yes sir so that you address all the statutory criteria yes sir and if and if uh, uh chairman anderson if you'd like if i can send i mean it's open records so i mean i could send some of you a copy of one so you'd take a look at what we did if you if you would like if you that, someone, that would be very very good if somebody would to do that i'll be glad to do right that. yes that'll be fine we'll, we'll blake will coordinate with you uh, to get that from you uh, and gentlemen if i if i may uh, representative leverett not to interrupt or anything but we are on a little bit of a time schedule yeah, today I, I had a feeling I was so uh, i know uh, uh wave that so okay <laughs> chairwoman taylor does have a, a question if we can make this our final question for mr weatherford thank you Thank you. Uh, just to follow up a moment on what he said, I was interested in how you conclude these. So you've you filled in some of those. Do you have any room for compromise or you have to just yes or no? For example, um, I was not really liking when you talked about, well, that developer will just wait a year and then they'll change the zoning. That does not seem appropriate. Is there some way you that's could- That's my opinion, ma'am, that's not- uh, No, it's my opinion too. Okay. So I wasn't comfortable with that. Is there any way that you can compromise and say, okay, but it's gonna be uh, five years unless you go get a, a referendum. You no, don't have any room for compromise. You have to say yes the, or no. Not unless you change the statute. Okay. Um, okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, sir. Thank we you. really appreciate that. Yes, sir. Uh, at this time, I'd like to uh, ask our representatives from ACCG and the counties. Uh, Todd, if you want to get your panel, Mr. Tommy Stallnacker, Pat Graham, and Jeff Rader. And Todd, at this moment, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the uh, study committee, I'm Todd Edwards. I'm the deputy legislative director at the Association County Commissioners of Georgia. Uh, I think there was a, a brief history that was sufficient on the history of what we referred to then as House Bill uh, 2, the negotiations that took place, what's in the law, it hasn't been changed since 2007. Um, had we, once after that was passed, the economy hit a bit of a snag. There was the housing bust. It hadn't been a lot of annexation. So for many years, this wasn't a, a compelling issue or an issue brought to the forefront of the General Assembly because quite frankly, there wasn't the growth that we had seen leading up until that point. Since then, the economy has rebounded. We all know the housing market's hot. There's been a lot of development and it becomes more and more of an issue. 
I would say overall, and this is just touching on, on some, some high level things, the vast majority of annexations are, 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 do not cause conflict, are not disputable. Uh, I think what we see mostly and what we hear from the counties, and if you look at the cases of the counties brought before the arbitration process, this is high growth areas, usually metropolitan areas where there's development and it deals specifically the conflicts with land use changes, density changes, and in some, some cases, the cost of infrastructure to the county providing services. Um, again, that's what we're seeing with more growth. Um, the, the, and the dispute process is limited, as stated earlier, to those grounds. Um, we've had roughly 56 cases, the best I can determine, uh, go through the dispute or the arbitration process since its establishment. Uh, 17 counties have been involved. What we've done, and I'll, a couple of questions real quick were asked uh, by Representative Thomas. What is binding uh, from the arbitration panel? See recommendations on our handout under issue number six. And we've summed that up for you. And as far as the cost allocation, and uh, that'll get brought up later, see recommendation five. ACCG at the request of the chairman established a subcommittee on annexation, uh, specifically to look at recommendations for improvements are the arbitration process. We have seven members. They're made up of both, all county commissioners. Uh, they're either involved on the, as an arbitration panelist, the commissioners on this panel, or they're in one of the, the counties that have had cases before the arbitration uh, panel. Today with us, I have Chairman Tommy Stonaker. He's from Houston County. He's gonna speak first. And he's also the chairman of ACCG's subcommittee. Also, we have with, with us Chairman Pat Graham from Barrow County and also Commissioner Jeff Rader from the DeKalb County. And if we have any legal questions in the audience, we also have Van Stevens. He's the attorney from Hall County who's been very involved in the process. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it over to our first speaker, Chairman Tommy Stoniker. Thank you, Todd, and good, this is live. And good morning, uh, Chairman Anderson and also other members of the legislative delegation that are on this subcommittee. Let me thank you for your service, first and foremost, to your districts that you represent and also to the state of Georgia. It does not go unnoticed for what you do for the state of Georgia. And I wanna thank you on behalf of not only Houston County, but uh, ACCG. ACCG is here today to offer improvements to the annexation, dispute resolution, arbitration process. Houston County's relationships with its three cities is great. It's outstanding. Actually, one of our mayors was here a few minutes ago and he had to step across the street. He'll be back. Uh, but he's a friend first and foremost. We get along is the point I'm trying to make uh, in Houston County. And I think most counties get along with their uh, cities as well. Uh, so this is not a fight with the cities. This is about fairness for all citizens involved, whether in the unincorporated area or the incorporated area as we go through this thing. I've seen it firsthand how this process has worked. I've been involved in several of the non-concur votes with the Houston County Board of Commissioners. And I will tell you, they are not pleasant when you have to be put in those positions to have those concur and non-concur votes. Uh, and hopefully today with some of the information that you're receiving that there will be improvements to this process. I think uh, there are some minor things that can be done and there are some major things that can be done. I believe there's three areas that can improve the annexation process. They are timing, administrative, and meaningful decisions of the arbitration panel. You have been given the documents from ACCG. I will not go through and read word for word in those documents, but I'm gonna talk about three different areas in those documents. And the first one is going to be issue number one as listed in your document that you have. It has to do with timing. Timelines are currently too tight in this process. I'm going to give you an example of a Houston County issue that we had. It is very much summarized what I'm fixing to tell you. A lot of details are being left out in the essence of time. Houston County non-concurred on a city annexation rezoning to a city's much denser rezoning request. It, it was going to be an R3 with the surrounding unincorporated areas 
is either R1 or RAG. This area was served by one rural road, one way in and one way out. It was literally gonna put hundreds of additional vehicles on that road if that annexation had gone through as an R3. Again, we had to act on this before the city ever acted on it at all. Had never been to their P and Z, never come before May and council. So it comes straight from the planning and zoning staff to the board of commissioners. And we was asked to make a decision on it. Two weeks later, after we non-concurred, the city's P and Z heard the application for the first time. During the time after non-concurrence, the county and the city and the developer and the property owner got together and worked out the differences and compromised on this zoning. The county's non-concurrence could have been avoided. It could have been avoided if we had not been asked to go first on the concur or non-concur was something that had not been presented to a governing board in the city. Uh, I will tell you the recommendations to follow up that illustration. And the uh, ACCG recommendations are require the city either through a vote of the governing authority or the planning and zoning commission to deem the annexation position, petition is correct and is accepted, and then forward the application to the county. The city vote is not final action on approving or denying the annexation. And let me underscore that. That vote would not approve or deny that annexation. It's merely to send it to us after they've had an opportunity to review the application. Also, the city can take however long they need to accept and review the application, but the county's 30 day shot clock, and I'm gonna use the word shot clock, but it's 30 days as it ticks down, should not commence until the city vote occurs and the county receives the annexations in per person. Also, another item that I'd like to point out in these recommendations is the property owners petitioning the annexation should be required current on paying their city and county taxes. And these rezonings not occur to taxes due to delinquent on property. Uh, and that has happened in some instances. It has not happened in Houston County to my knowledge, but we have recently started checking that uh, when we would get an annexation rezoning application before us. Another item I'd like to bring to your attention is issue number two, what we've given you. And it's identified as notifications. Let me say, uh, tell you this experience with Houston County. And it goes back with, with DCA and uh, I think DCA may have thought we was getting sideways with them, but we was not getting sideways with them, but it's a uh, situation that I think needs to be rectified. Our county commissioners met on the night of the 29th day out of our 30 day shot clock. That was our meeting for us to concur or non-concur, the 29th day on the 30 day shot clock concerning the rezone. So the next morning, our county attorney hand delivered the non-concurrence to the city of Warner Robins and notified them. They signed for the documents. We in turn send them on to DCA and they in turn rejected the application because we failed to follow the statute and they had every right to do that. But in the meantime, we worked out our differences Thus, we wasted DCA's time on filing the arbitration. And the answer, in my opinion, is allow other methods for notification, first and foremost, emails, in-person, other methods, and also allow a pause before filing an arbitration with DCA. Give the two governments an opportunity to get it resolved before you have to file 
this action with DCA. I think that would help immensely. As far as the recommendations from ACCG, uh, we would recommend that they, uh, again, we be authorized as well as the city to uh, receive the notifications by email, in person, or by some other means, in addition to what is already in the statute. And the last item I wanna to talk to you about is the arbitration panel extending the shot clock. Uh, it's been very well discussed as far as an individual that sits on that arbitration panel of some of the difficulties they have and the condensed time they have to work in. The 60 days that they have to give a response back is pretty tight when they can't get the appropriate people together, they can't get the appropriate information and all. And our recommendation is give at least a 10 day variance for the chairman of that arbitration committee should that chairman need uh, additional time on those 60 days in reviewing these cases and all, and it's not hurried up and it can be done with study and uh, a lot of uh, investigation on what's been presented and all. Those are the three items that, that I have, but I will tell you that is not a cookie cutter for all the counties in the state. I'm giving you Houston County's experiences. And uh, I think they can be improved upon. Uh, again, we are not against the cities. We are for the cities, but the problem exists most of the time on the density in the zoning. Where I mentioned in my first comment, that's where a lot of the rub comes in, particularly in our county, between the cities and the county on the density slapping up to another area in the county. Uh, with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Commissioner Jeff Ryder with the Cab County, and he's gonna to touch on some other issues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the chairman of the study committee and uh, to the members of the panel. We certainly appreciate um, your attention to these issues um, and uh, share with you the interest, I think, of the public uh, in trying to make this process an effective one. I'm Jeff Rader. I'm a member of the DeKalb County uh, Commission. As you may know, DeKalb is a full service county. So regardless of whether you're in a city or in the county, many of the services uh, will continue to be delivered by uh, the county uh, sanitation, the um, water and sewer, uh, obviously all of our county constitutional services. Um, and in many cases, we have uh, cities which are deemed to be cities light that uh, really only provide uh, certain regulatory uh, activities rather than any substantive service provision. So um, this issue of uh, annexation is critical in an urban county such as DeKalb. There are no areas of the county that are substantially undeveloped or unpopulated by constituents, not only of the county commission, um, but also uh, constituents of the members of the General Assembly. So uh, those folks, whether they happen to live on the inside or the outside of the uh, city line are nevertheless remain our constituents both uh, and like us, you members of the General Assembly uh, will be serving folks inside and outside of these jurisdictions. So I think that um, you know, our viewpoint is often aligned in regard to uh, service to those constituents. Um, we as uh, and it's important to uh, think of it that way within the context of this particular uh, statute, because really there are only three entities that are empowered or recognized within this. One is the applicant uh, for annexation. They are uh, allowed under the current statute to act unilaterally and the city has to immediately uh, within five days uh, respond uh, and make that notification. Um, there is the city, um, which has to consider that annexation and that is valid that a petition should be uh, duly considered by a city. Um, and then obviously uh, the county likewise has an interest um, based upon these criteria and we would argue broader criteria um, as it relates to the interests that we represent uh, and the citizens and constituents we serve. 
um, the one party or interest group that is not formally represented in this process are constituents um, that are affected by uh, the annexation and the likely change in uh, land use entitlement that is associated with it, particularly as they relate to unincorporated residents who will be affected and continue to be affected by the annexation and potentially the re-entitlement. And I think it's important that y'all, as you deliberate on this, put yourselves in those folks' shoes because um, county governments have to continue to represent them the legislature has to continue to represent them, but because municipalities have finite boundaries and are not um, uh, comprehensive, uh, they are not represented in the decisions that cities make because they are not constituents of those municipal governments. And I would urge you to kind of put that lens as you look onto this. Um, the process uh, is, um, as has been mentioned many times, is one that uh, you know, has some very uh, specific timelines in it. Um, Chairman Stallnecker uh, certainly identified this notion of the beginning of the process really be driven by the applicant as opposed to the city government. Um, we have to then respond uh, to a five-day notice. Um, and even if uh, the uh, application is uh, not accurate or well-constructed or um, is not complete, nevertheless, that process begins. And so we wanna make sure um, that things are uh, correct and that we're working together with the municipality and the other parties uh, to make the best decisions for uh, the stakeholders involved. Therefore, we believe that um, this shouldn't proceed like a freight train. And if the county and the city agree that they likewise should have the opportunity to mutually stay the arbitration process. Again, many, are, many um, uh, annexations, uh, the vast majority are uncontested. Um, where they are contested, they may be contested for valid reasons that can be uh, negotiated between the parties. But if time is not available, then uh, that process can start to uh, leave us no opportunity for something other than uh, the type of uh, confrontation that the um, arbitration process really is intended to mediate. So we recommend that the city and the county be authorized by mutual agreement and only through mutual agreement to postpone or temporarily stay the arbitration process for negotiation and to discuss the issue and make sure that everybody's on the same sheet of paper. That'll allow us to work with our um, municipalities because there is no uh, strong mechanism within uh, particularly uh, um, service delivery strategy or anything to uh, require cooperation on those border areas where you might see these types of uh, uh, negotiations appropriately in place. Um, the funding ratio ought to be changed. Um, you know, as a county, we intend to do what it takes um, to get uh, our uh, constituents well represented and to make sure that the best decision is made. But the, uh, the statutory uh, um, allocation 7525 really does not represent the level of effort that is required between the two. I think that it should be assumed that this is not a, um, a, a valid way of trying to prevent frivolous um, uh, objections to annexation. Um, and instead we should be equal parties. And so therefore um, we'd like to see uh, that the, uh, it be established that the expenses are split 50-50 down the middle. If it's important enough um, to uh, advance, then it should be important enough for everyone to have a stake in paying for. Um, the uh, third issue that I uh, have is um, and it was mentioned before that this one year limitation to the conditions is simply not long enough. Um, that is process time in most major developments. And so um, by limiting the one year uh, uh, period, um, that makes these processes almost irrelevant. A uh, developer can build that one year into their process. They can be unconstrained by uh, an arbitration simply by annexing in and then doing their homework and then going after uh, the substantial uh, change in entitlement uh, that they're looking for and it wouldn't be any uh, burden on them. It should be up to uh, 
three years um, so that, uh, in fact, it does burden that process. Um, the, uh, we believe that, uh, likewise, the county should be bound by the same sort of a limitation uh, because you wouldn't want us to be shopping zoning between one jurisdiction or another. So, uh, you know, that stability, I think, is needed on both sides. Um, finally, we've heard this before also is um, uh, this issue is um, a critical one because um, all of this effort and all of the good work of uh, uh, Chairman Weatherford and others um, should not go to uh, any um, waste because uh, the process does not extend long enough and uh, to adequate number of issues. So I know that we're short on time, so I'll yield at this point, but thank you for uh, hearing uh, these concerns and they're also included in the ACCG uh, position paper. Thank you. Good morning. Mr. Chairman, panel members, I thank you for the opportunity to be here. I think this is a very worthy topic of discussion. Um, my name is Pat Graham. For the past eight years, I've had the pleasure of serving as the chairman of the Barrow County Board of Commissioners. Eight years prior to that, I served as the mayor of Brazelton. I've also been an arbitration uh, panelist since the first class was offered by the DCA. So I've sat in, in all three seats here. Um, I think one of the things I want to circle back to, to one of our very first items quickly. Someone mentioned the number of objections that are made uh, by counties to annexation requests and then how many actually go through the arbitration process. The majority of objections that are made are resolved before the panel sets foot in the room to do anything. I've been selected for quite a few arbitration panels and received notice a day before that the parties have resolved the dispute and that the annexation is canceled. I think that happens through communication. Um, and allowing, let me back up. In, in terms of zoning, when a zoning application is given to a city or to a county, that project can change dramatically from the time that application is received by staff to when staff does a review of it and applies their own zoning regulations, puts recommendations on it, a planning commission will take comment from the public and place conditions on it. And all those steps can change a project dramatically. But the way this statute is set up, a county has to object within a certain number of days. The city has to forward that annexation request within five days. No one has looked at it. It may be a project the city would like. It may be a project that the city will reject. But the county is forced to make its decision before it knows what this project is really gonna be. So the reason for, uh, I think our, our topic number one is to allow a city to review the application, allow the city's planning commission to review the application and allow a city to make a decision of accepting or rejecting the application before the shot clock starts. That way, everyone is looking at what might be put on the ground by a developer. Um, I wanna bring you to item number seven. Uh, and just real quickly, question is, should a court reporter or other recorder be appointed to record um, arbitration proceedings? This has been mentioned by several different arbitration panels that they felt as though a court reporter should be present. Um, sometimes when a ruling is made by an arbitration panel, an opportunity for appeal is not possible because there is no record of the proceeding. So this is something that ACCG could agree to um, so long as the cost of the court reporter is split evenly between city and county. Item number eight, should arbitration panels be provided legal counsel or an administrative hearing officer? This one has also been mentioned earlier. Um, we do agree that this could be beneficial in most instances, but again, feel as though it should be split out of fairness, split evenly uh, between both parties. The last issue I'm gonna bring up is issue number nine. Uh, should DCA maintain a record of arbitration panel results? I don't know if you've ever been to the DCA website, but they maintain a database on just about everything that happens, um, especially planning and zoning related. They have DRI information that almost goes back 20 years. Um, they also keep a very extensive list of every annexation that's taken place. It would be great if we could also have a record of how many annexation 
um, how many annexation requests are contested, and then how many actually ultimately go through to arbitration and what the results of the arbitration are, um, and whether or not the project moved forward. We just think that'd be valuable information to have. And for the last item, I'm going to turn the topics back, turn the topic back to uh, Commissioner Jeff Rader. Well, and I'll be very brief on the last item, which is number 10 on your list. And you've heard this before. Um, the uh, the purpose for annex, uh, the purpose for uh, arbitration objection should not be limited to financial impact on the operation of a particular government. We should return to our ultimate responsibility and be able to uh, object based upon the impact uh, to other factors, those that our constituents care about, uh, by simply removing the term material in OCGA 36-36113A, uh, um, it would give us the ability to not have to link this to some sort of a financial impact and instead be able to look at it the way that your constituents and ours would in terms of the impact on their communities, their level of service and their quality of life. So uh, we would encourage you to try to take that straight jacket off a little bit so that um, we can represent everybody's interests. So uh, that was the last point on our agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know there's a lot of information to be had. We've try tried to provide a lot of it in the issues and the recommendations we submitted to the committee. Uh, we kept within our 30 minutes. If there are questions, we're happy to answer them. Uh, and if we don't have the answers, we'll get them for you. So with that, thank you all very much for this opportunity. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for, for coming here today. Uh, members of the committee, do we have any questions? I will mention we are on a little time constraint. It's not our time constraint, it's the meeting room, but we think that we may be okay there. Uh, just as long as the electronics don't shut down at the at 1130. If they do, we'll start them back up. Uh, but uh, if there are any uh, uh, questions at this time, we'll entertain them and, uh, and do understand that we will uh, this is this study committee is we're compiling information that we will be reviewing to determine whether there, there are bills that need to be introduced to correct issues or some other type of corrective or, or improvements that can be made in our next session. So uh, just because questions may or may not be asked today, there may be follow up stuff. So I appreciate every uh, panelist uh, making themselves available for that purpose. Uh, Representative Thomas. Thank you. Appreciate y'all being here today. Um, I, I've regularly heard it characterized that most people want to annex into the city because they feel like they have better services from the city versus what they're going to get from the county. Um, but with that being said, how, would, how often do you see uh, maybe a mom and pop that owns 40 acres want to annex into the city? And that would be something that you would be find objectionable. Does that question make sense? All I can say is I know that of the cases that are objected to uh, the vast majority are dealing with increases in land density and zoning. And the majority of the counties in which these annexations occur are already being provided services by a metropolitan county. Okay, so just because I wanna make sure I get this on the record, you all have no issue with a mom and pop wanting to annex into the city. That's not, not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is really these, this dispute resolution process is typically driven out of the fact that there's a change in land use. Is that correct? That is what state law requires, and that's what we agreed to. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions on the part of the committee? All right, seeing none, thank you again very much, and uh, uh, please be safe in your travels. Next on our agenda, uh, I'd like to uh, ask Mr. Tom Gale and Paul Radford to come up front. Tom is with uh, the uh, Georgia Municipal Association. And Mr. Radford is a city manager of Sugar Hill. So, Tom, I'll uh, turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the study committee. I'm Tom Gale with the Georgia Municipal Association. Glad to be here with you all today. Um, the annexation law is complex. It's been fine-tuned over the years. And, and um, for those of you who have trouble sleeping at night or would like to really uh, d delve into the entirety of the annexation law, um, you have a handout there that's that's um, a 129 page booklet that goes through 
all of the processes for annexation, including the uh, zoning procedures for land to be annexed, including which has been, been a topic of discussion today, including the dispute resolution process. Um, back when this process was created with HB2 in the 20, uh, 2007 session, um, the intent was to create a process for resolving disputes between county and city governments. Um, I think that uh, as, as my friend and, and colleague uh, Todd Edwards has, has presented, uh, since that time, we've only seen 57 disputes in 17 counties. And I, I would say that that, in a, to a certain extent, uh, makes a case for, um, for, for why this process um, is working. It's, it's only in a, a, a small number of, uh, a small minority of counties where this process has been, been used. Um, and uh, similarly, um, uh, I, I think that it is working in many cases, like uh, Commissioner Graham said, uh, many of these disputes, many of these panels that are created are resolved before the panel even has to have a discussion. That I think is, is a testament that, that the process works in the city and county governments, particularly those that work together um, uh, and, and have a relationship can work these, these things out uh, before they uh, require the panels to be, um, uh, to, to start their evidence gathering and deliberating. So early this summer, we shared uh, some some ideas that were generated about how to improve the annexation arbitration panel process with uh, our friends over at ACCG. Our hope was that we would come up with a a, a bilateral group of recommendations for you all uh, that were consensus recommendations from GMA, GMA and ACCG, primarily in the hopes that we would work together on coming up with some solutions um, uh, rather than potentially uh, having some some uh, disagreements. Um, unfortunately, ACCG decided to come up with their own task force and, and unilateral recommendations. The good thing about that is that many of those recommendations are uh, mirroring the recommendations and ideas that were generated from our members. So that's that, that's a positive thing. And we have a number of, of areas of agreement and, and areas where we can, where GMA can support um, items on, on ACCG's list. Um, uh, Chairman, what I'd like to do is, is since ACCG has provided this template and they've covered these items, uh, I think it's it's worthwhile for for myself and for for Paul to uh, go through uh, point by point. We'll be super brief on some of them because we are in agreement with their some of those recommendations, and then we'll we'll share some of the concerns that we have about the others. Um, so uh, let me start with issue number one. The uh, the, the main recommendation there is that. Um, that the city should have to deem an annexation uh, petition as complete um, before they notify the county and that, that current law um, uh, should be changed to require a city council vote. Um, as has been stated, some city councils uh, meet once a month, some meet um, even more irregularly than that, um, depending on their size. Uh, there are processes in place now internally within cities where they determine whether an annexation petition is complete. And I would encourage this committee to allow those cities to continue with those processes. Um, the, the current law does require, once we at the city level um, determine uh, an annexation petition is complete, it requires us within five days to submit that notification to the county of that annexation petition. Um, we, we, could, we could have some discussion about giving the cities flexibility in uh, that five-day time period, um, but, uh, but, but basically uh, requiring a city council vote um, prior to even moving forward on, on a, uh, officially accepting a um, annexation petition, I think is unnecessary. Um, and then on the deficiencies or, or suggestion that these annexation petitions are not complete, uh, I would simply say that we, uh, we ask our partners over at the Department of Community Affairs to do what they've done in many instances and in many other areas of the law to create a, a checklist, a common checklist um, that each petition should meet for city councils, uh, city planning offices, city staff um, before they move forward um, with the notification of the county. Paul, uh, do you want to introduce yourself and, and add yeah. to that? I'm Paul Rafford. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm the city manager of the city of Sugar Hill. Um, just as a, a point of context, my 
my background is um, I was with GMA for 12 years before going to Sugar Hill. I've been there for eight years. And, and prior to that, um, you're seeing a trend here. I'm old. Um, is for 22 years, I was the deputy commissioner of the, of the Department of Community Affairs. So I'm intimately familiar with the role of DCA from its infancy um, to where it is now. And, um, and DCA is adept um, at um, uh, preparing checklists and instructions on, on step-by-step processes that you, know, you have to go through, whether it's for planning, uh, service delivery, um, in this case would be annexation. Um, our process is uh, once um, we get a request um, for annexation and we don't go shopping for them, um, they come to us um, and they're generally always by the 100% methods. Um, we look for its completeness by state law. We um, um, uh, make sure that um, we know what the parcels look like. We have a legal description. We have a map. We have a, a proposed site plan. And we also have a, um, a proposed um, uh, land use uh, for, the, um, for the property. It is that point in time that we then submit it to the county. And I've been there for eight years and we've had a number of annexations um, done through this process. And the Gwinnett County has not objected to one of them. Uh, we have a great relationship and, I, and I, can, I, I don't think you heard that from the county as well. I think cities and counties try to work together. Um, and there, there are gonna be occasions where there's a difference of opinion. But we have open communication well before that. So once we notify that, then I then take it to the city council um, and tell the city council that we received one um, and that it will be then going to the planning commission and we'll be back to you in the uh, next month or two. Um, that gives the county um, uh, its statutory 30 days to respond. Um, we always get it well before then. Um, it comes um, from the county administrator. Um, and um, I, I, don't, I don't think we've ever had one other than wanting to be notified if the annexation and the rezoning go through for us to notify them. And, and I would also add that, that um, uh, once a city, uh, a city can't even start their zoning process until the county is notified. And so um, th that, that's a trigger for the, the potential zoning process. And, and as Paul would, would, uh, has told me many times um, that if, an, if a, there are two processes, basically, that the city would have to undertake when an annexation uh, comes before council. The first, first is whether to accept the annexation. Um, the city council can deny it, of course. Um, but if they accept it, the very next thing they do is zone the property, have a zoning hearing. And so those zoning processes, uh, the procedures have to be followed um, concurrently with the annexation petition. Uh, because the land, when it's considered by the city, would come in unzoned. Um, so that's something to take into account. Um, so uh, uh, issue, um, uh, the, the last issue on, on issue number one for the counties is the, the suggestion that, that petitioners for annexation should be required to be current on paying their city and county property taxes. Uh, we, we've never heard of this kind of issue coming up before, but I think that if there is some sort of consideration to this, um, I would A, um, uh, make sure that you all look at, at this kind of requirement for all types of permitting um, that, that uh, are, are received by county, city governments, by state governments, look at potential uh, occupational licenses, professional licenses, driver's licenses, utility hookups, and uh, uh, even authorize uh, local governments to expand the ability to um, do debt set off uh, from state, in, uh, state income taxes when uh, these businesses or landowners um, uh, owe unpaid property taxes. And then se secondly, I would keep in mind that, that uh, you may not be current on your taxes because you're in dispute with the government about the validity of the tax bill that you've gotten. And I think that's something that you all need to be really careful about. Um, issue number two, the additional means of city and county notification. Great idea, it was one of the ideas that, that our uh, city officials uh, suggested. Uh, we don't want uh, a situation like Chairman Stallnocker uh, described in which you physically hand a, a notification before this 30 day timeline. And uh, because you didn't statutorily overnight send it, uh, it's, it's no longer eligible for objection we support additional uh, means of, of notification. Uh, issue number three, 
the limited opportunity to extend uh, the shot clock of the arbitration panel uh, by the by the, right now the ACG recommendation is that the chairperson be allowed to extend that that um, shot clock support this in concept I think that you all may want to consider uh, it being a vote of the panel itself rather than just the chairperson but uh, but certainly that's that's a, a, an acceptable um, suggestion uh, issue number four city and county should have an, have an opportunity to mutually stay the arbitration panel process absolutely absolutely I mean uh, as Commissioner Graham said earlier most of these disputes get worked out most of these disputes get worked out and so um, if you can get the city and county governments talking um, working with the landowners to to potentially come up with acceptable resolution to some of these plans um, for rezoning then um, give the, the the ability to mutually stay the process Issue number five, this is where we've got some, some difference of opinion with the county, and this is where the arbitration funding ratio should be changed. Um, when House Bill 2 was put into place, um, a couple of factors were discussed. Uh, one, if the objection is material enough for the county to object, to basically say, we're going to have a financial burden, it should have the ability to, uh, or, or should have the requirement to pay the bulk of the cost of these proceedings. They're the ones who are dragging the city into the, to, to the courtroom, so to speak. And counties, as you all know, have a bigger tax base. And when you shift costs from the county government to cities, particularly smaller municipalities, um, it can be financially burdensome on some of these smaller cities. And Keep in mind, the county tax dollars come from everyone in the county, including the landowner who's petitioning to annex and the, the city residents. And so the, the county is, is essentially using its uh, money collected countywide to fight a landowner and their desire to come into the city. And then lastly, even if the annexation occurs, the property in that's annexed is still in the county. Um, I once heard a, 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 a anecdote of a county commissioner who said, we've lost X number of acres to annexation uh, in, in these past five years. And then a city official pipes up and says, well, we found them. They're still in your county and they're just in our city. Um, so the county uh, always will have those, those properties on their tax rolls. Um, Another suggestion in that item number five was that property owners petitioning for the annexation should pay, pay their own arbitration costs. Again, keep in mind that when a county objects to an annexation, it's not fighting against the cities. It's fighting against the owner or owners of that land that want to bring their property into the city. It's the municipality who becomes a part of this process uh, as the legal entity of this process. And my experience with the General Assembly is that it's been very su supportive of property rights in the past. And um, when you put property owners in a position of, of having to uh, bring their lawyers and bring their, their financial resources to bear against a, a county with a huge tax base, um, that can be problematic. Uh, do you have anything to add to that, Tom? Yeah, in many times, um, the uh, the landowner um, is a um, legacy landowner. They've had it, the property for years um, and um, they are desiring to come into the city. Um, they're going to, they want to get it rezoned. Um, the process is a little bit quicker. That is true. Um, but they are, um, you don't see them shopping, um, but I'm not too sure that you know, uh, we want to force them to pay for the cost of the, um, of the, uh, arbitration itself in that the the entire service delivery strategy that local governments are required to participate in have balanced these cost ratios um, already and um, so it, it, in, in the 75 25 ratio was something that was negotiated years ago um, I I would I would I think this is a government the government um, discussion and the property owner, uh, I don't think should have to pay. So 
uh, moving on to issue number six, which is an arbitration panel should be authorized to attach zoning, land use, or, or density conditions to a property for up to three years. So GMA would oppose this change to state law. I mean, current law allows these unelected arbitration panels to currently establish a, a one-year uh, zoning classification on the deeds that are coming in. Um, but they shouldn't really lock a property owner into uh, a, a, this panel's um, decision for, for longer than that. To do so would really be shifting the zoning powers um, even further away from elected county and city officials, uh, and in this case, city officials. But uh, there is a provision in law that, that was slightly touched on today um, that prevents a county from rezoning a property for one year after a city rejects an annexation petition or the petitioner abandons the annexation. Um, to me, if, if it's uh, something that, that the county wants to impose a three-year timeout on a landowner's ability to ask for a rezoning within a city um, after an annexation, then perhaps uh, land outside of count in unincorporated areas outside of cities should have similar three year timeout periods um, when an annexation is abandoned or when an annexation is denied. Um, but even then you're, you're essentially uh, removing the constitutionally uh, delegated authorized uh, powers of city and county governments um, when you put those kind of restrictions on, on them. Uh, would you, do you have anything to add to that, Paul? The um, <clears throat> putting uh, the comment was made earlier that a one time a one year time frame is um, um, fairly short in the um, in the development cycle, um, and I don't know of a developer that's going to wait twelve months um, um, for an entitlement under an annexation and rezoning. Um, uh, generally, um, all of their money. Um, that they got involved in the process um, um, goes hard um, when they get their zoning, and um, and and the um, so they're expected to pay um, uh, for that land um, at that time. Um, so I think the twelve month is um, was a negotiated um, time frame many many years ago, and I think it still um, is um, legitimate even in today's market. Um, you know, it's interesting, um, uh, the, uh, the reasons for objections of, of density, you know, zoning, the financial burden, the, those were the, the things that um, cities heard that annexation caused the problem. Um, widening that to, a, um, to bring in anything, any possible discussion, I think um, doesn't clarify the issue. It, it, you know, I think it actually makes the issue a little bit more blurry. I think we, if, if there are legitimate financial or, um, or land use issues, those need to be objected to and negotiated. Um, you know, the, um, um, it, every city and every county is different. Um, I, I, I'm from Gwinnett County and um, we're a city of about 25,000 people. Um, we're growing. Um, uh, funny thing is we've had, Gwinnett County has been very, very supportive of our annexations, um, both in the 100% method as well as legislatively. Um, in fact, they helped lobby for one of ours several years ago. Um, and, um, but a city resident does not have the same stature um, at a, at a um, Gwinnett County um, uh, Commission, uh, Planning Commission meeting when, uh, when annexations, um, not annexation, when rezonings are occurring right outside our boundaries. Uh, you know, we, we, we opposed any density that is outside of our boundaries. We think density should be in our downtown, um, not in the peripheral of our downtown, of our city. Um, but we have no standing um, in that other than one municipal seat on a nine member um, uh, planning commission when it's within our sphere of influence. Uh, so I think that the, um, um, the, the time frame um, I think is legitimate as it sits. And I think the, um, the process needs to maintain its focus of financial burden, land use, and density. So uh, we'll take 
uh, issue number seven and eight at the same time. Uh, this is should a court reporter be be appointed to record the process and also should the arbitration panels be provided legal counsel or, or an administrative hearing officer. One thing I'd call to your attention, this is in your handouts. Um, back in uh, uh, 2008, um, in an effort, a joint effort by GMA and ACG, we put together this joint um, handbook. It's called the Arbitration <clears throat> Handbook for, for Annexation Land Use Disputes. And it's actually got in this handbook um, uh, all of the, it's, it's a how-to guide to be an arbitration panelist. And it's even got the, um, uh, the, the form that, that Mr. Weatherford was talking about um, that, that the chairs will, will go through. But in this guide, it talks about how each panel, one of the first things they should do is, is get the parties to designate case coordinators so that so that there's someone who the, the city designates as a case coordinator, someone who the county de designates as a case coordinator, and then somebody who uh, is, is designated by the uh, landowner or landowners who are, are, are a party to this process. Um, and it, it even on page 29 goes through the duties of a case coordinator. And, and many of those are included, very similar, Rep Chair, Chairwoman Oliver, to some of the, the requirements that you proposed in your legislation uh, this past legislative session. Um, again, these are some some uh, items that that back in 2008 we recommended each panel uh, go through and in, in, in setting up these these assistant duties for for folks. Uh, many of these counties, uh, I, I, Todd perhaps could share the 17 counties that have gone through this this process, but many of these counties are uh, uh, very large urban counties with uh, planning staff. And uh, many of the cities uh, fit the same um, uh, description. And so uh, they, at the, at the city and county level, have the ability in many instances to provide these case coordinators to help with the work of the panel and keep an eye on each other, right? Um, and I'm, I'm ha half uh, serious when you all uh, look at the statute to allow legislators to potentially be uh, qualified to serve as arbitration panel uh, members. Um, then you'd really be experts at some point in the future. Um, so uh, moving on to, um, uh, to issue number nine, uh, that ACCG's recommendation is to require DCA to produce, maintain, and annually update a record of annexation arbitration pro uh, uh, cases, parties involved, issue raised, et cetera. Absolutely, we, GMA agrees with this rep, rec, uh, recommendation. DCA, as uh, Commissioner Hag Deputy Commissioner Haygood has, has talked about, has uh, kept records, uh, most, not all um, uh, complete because of sometimes the spotty um, uh, uh, dissemination of, by, the, by the arbitration panels, um, but they surprisingly do have a, a, a decent uh, amount of information about what they've been able to glean from the, um, the arbitration panel processes that, that, that um, have been triggered by DCA. Um, and then issue number 10, this is the, the one that, uh, that uh, the suggestion that, that the General Assembly should remove the term material so that counties can object to an annexation based on, on other factors besides just a material financial burden. Um, GMA would vigorously oppose this, this change in law this unilateral recommendation is far beyond any suggestions for improving the annexation arbitration panel process. It would be a drastic and substantive change to the annexation law. And, and the, the, it, it's as if they should have proposed instead of removing the term material, instead replace it with immaterial burden or de minimis burden or frivolous or subjective burden. It's just um, a non-starter for us. Um, so do you have anything to add on that before I? No, I, 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 think, I think my point earlier was that um, um, the objections need to be, I think, focused and, and clear. And um, um, that would allow room for resolution um, if, if in terms of whether it's density, whether if there is a real material burden that uh, the, in this case, the, um, the Party that's receiving the the property, the, the city, then I think the city 
um, legitimately needs to consider that and look how to, how to adjust that. So, so, so in closing, um, annexations are really the natural ways that cities grow to accommodate the needs of their community and the landowners who want to be served by a local government that's, that's closer to them. Um, most of these annexations are occurring through the 100% method. Um, they're, uh, all the landowners want to be in the city that, that are making this petition. Um, the census numbers were released, as you all know. Um, Georgia's growing primarily in the metro uh, Atlanta area and in some of these um, uh, major MSAs like Houston County. Um, we're going to continue to grow. We're going to continue to look at, uh, at growth pressures, not only on city governments, but on county governments. Um, density will be an issue for city governments, for county governments, and how we, we accommodate affordable housing, uh, economic development, um, uh, and, and, and other growth pressures is going to be a real topic for not only uh, uh, state policymakers, but for city and county leaders. Um, city governments are open for business and we're ready to work with you all on potential changes to the annexation arbitration panel process. Be glad to try to answer. Any okay, questions. thank you, gentlemen. That was a, a, a very informative presentation. Also, I'd like to recognize Chairwoman Oliver. Your agreements and disagreements were very helpful. Thank you. You heard Mr. Weatherford said he always asks if a tax abatement is being implemented pursuant to an annexation. Do you always, you, the city, always know if a tax abatement is being negotiated when an annexation proposal comes to you? I'll defer to Paul on that, but before I answer it, um, I would like to, Mr. Chairman, if it's okay, uh, suggest for those of you who don't have the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, please take a look at the op-ed page today. We're uh, amongst a, 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 a very, uh, a prolific writer, a good, good op-ed in the paper today. And I think you've asked some really good questions on that topic, but Paul, do you wanna? Yes, I would know um, if, um, if the developer was seeking um, uh, an abatement or some way of, um, of offsetting the cost as part of an annexation. I have not had one. Um, and I'm not too sure that um, I'm, I would recommend um, that we move further um, if, um, if the abatement was part of the annexation. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Yes, Representative Leverett. I'm, I'm just curious, how would you necessarily know that? Because cities don't generally don't, you can't offer tax abatement. That's usually done by the development authority. Um, yes, it would, um, it would be done through some, um, either downtown development authority or a development authority. We can't do that directly. Right. Direct. Um, but um, so I gather customarily they would have notified yeah, you. Yeah, any um, any developer that's coming in um, um, or landowner that's coming in, um, the the conditions of the zoning uh, of the annexation request and the zoning uh, would be um, a part of that deliberation very early on. Um, and um, and I've had not have not had one that have um, that was part of it. It was for um, the speed of the process. A, a city of twenty five is much more nimble than a county of a million. Um, and our county of a million does a fantastic job. Um, but the landowner wants to be have an affiliation with the city um, because of a service we provide. Um, and uh, for the um, if if part of the development. And the, and the ROI on that development depended upon an abatement, um, I would know it. Thank you. Okay, Representative Thomas. Thank you very much. I appreciate y'all being here. Um, I, I wanna start off by saying that I will, this is our first meeting. Obviously we have three more. Um, I would have really preferred to see y'all bring some solutions to the table instead of just refuting the ACCG's positions. I think that would have been really helpful. Well, just just as a, a to to follow up, um, many of the the recommendations that we support mm -hmm. were shared with ACCG back in June and are on their list, as I said in the beginning. And I think uh, that's encouraging mm -hmm. uh, because um, when I started this process, knowing that this study committee was was going to move forward in its work, um, my hope was to share ideas that we were getting from our members with ACCG and come 
arm in arm with a set of recommendations that were consensus recommendations. Uh, the good news is that we're in agreement with them um, and uh, they've adopted into their document some of the ideas that we've shared with them based on our member feedback. So, so we're not just objecting to ACCG's uh, recommendations that in many instances, I would argue are far beyond uh, improvements of the arbitration panel process, but instead are substantive changes to the annexation statute. And, and, I, and I understand that. I, I just, uh, it, to me, whenever you start a process off, it's usually just good for everybody to bring their ideas to the table. And, you know, we have three more meetings to talk about what you don't like on the ACCG, ACCG side, same as ACCG's got three more meetings to talk about that. So I, I, I just want to be solutions driven, not uh, what I don't want to do is get into, you know, heavy debate um, so early in the process, I guess, is and that, that's really just anecdotal. Um, now, one of the comments that I've heard um, carried out consistently through this process is most of the time this thing works out before it ever goes to, to um, any type of arbitration process. And it sounds like everybody's in agreement with me. I, I can tell you I run a business and 99% of my contracts work out just perfect. I don't ever have to go to court. But when I do, that's when it gets important. So I want to focus on the fact that what we need to do here in this committee is to um, make sure that we're, we have a good arbitration process. And I appreciate your input on that. Um, one other thing that I, I do have a question, and it has to really to do with the fact that we've brought up that there's really three people involved or three in groups that are involved in, in the dispute resolution process. And that's the city, the counties and the landowner, correct? It, 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 do I have the correct understanding of that? Say again? I said there's three people that have, or three entities that have, you know, a piece of the process stakeholder. One would be the cities, one would, or the municipalities, one would be the counties, one would be the landowner, correct? So, again, if you would look at this, um, this arbitration handbook, the, the, the landowner or owners are the ones that trigger this whole process because they make the petition and the petition includes a rezoning request. Mm -hmm. um, the city has to respond um, and the county, if they object, well, they're part of the process too. So those are the three parties that are legally allowed to uh, participate in this, this process. Um, I think where you're going with this is to say, uh, very similar to my uh, county commissioner, Jeff Rader's comments, that, that um, people who are in the sphere of, uh, of, um, of influence of a particular rezoning have, have um, uh, potential feelings uh, about the, the uh, impacts of those annexations and those rezonings. Um, I would agree. And I think uh, Paul mentioned that uh, municipal residents oftentimes um, get uh, bent out of shape when county commissions uh, have rezonings that, uh, that their citizens uh, don't like, but uh, the city councils have no ability to, to prevent that. So yes, obviously uh, uh, the not in my backyard sentiment prevails uh, and it's gonna, it's gonna get worse as uh, Georgia continues to grow and as we have discussion about affordable housing and density, et cetera. Yeah, I actually want to hop over to the ACCG sheet. Let's see, yeah, actually, we're, we're, I appreciate the sentiment. That actually wasn't the direction I was planning on going with that. Um, if you look at, um, you actually made a comment, I'm trying to actually find the note. Um, about individuals and those landowners and their cost associated with, um, you know, the arbitration process. Um, you know, my experience has been, and this was kind of a, why I asked the ACCG this question earlier, it's not necessary, use the term landowners, but what I've seen is what it, a landowner is, is it's a landowner who wants to sell a property to a developer who wants to redevelop that property with increased zoning. So, I mean, to me, it, it's, it's duplicitous to say landowner, really what I hear is developer, because again, the ACCG has made this, this point of the fact that they're not arguing or they're not debating with you with regards to mom and pop rezoning into a municipality. They're debating with you higher density. So um, I, I, I'm just a little curious if you would 
reconsider that, spend some time over the next couple of weeks to reconsider that and to think about the fact that we're not talking about mom and pop. We're talking about a lot of times a developer. Okay. Address that point. Yeah, I, I, I'd actually, please do. I, I, I'd like your input. Um, I mean, obviously in, 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 the, in the real world, it is the developer that is mm -hmm. party to the application, but the, it is the landowner that is the, is the, um, is the official applicant for annexation. Correct. Um, and um, you know, the developer obviously is the one that is um, seeking the, re, the rezoning. Uh, and uh, my experience um, has been that it is the landowner that is particularly interested mm -hmm. um, in, in the outcome. They have, um, they, in many cases, they've sat on this property for many generations. Um, and it is an opportunity for them to uh, sell a property mm -hmm. um, um, at a higher per acre value than, than it has been over the years. Uh, uh, but my experience has also been that they are very, very sensitive to their neighbors uh, in terms of um, what the developer is going to be proposing is something that they feel comfortable with. Uh, and I, I just think I also need to clarify that um, we've had, in my eight years, we've had two that we've turned down uh, because of concerns of unincorporated residents. Uh, and then the um, the applicant and the developer then went to the county seeking more intense development than what we felt it should be for that particular area. Uh, but it was the landowner that was um, that was seeking uh, the developers to simply um, um, to be able to get there. I don't know if that addresses. I mean, if, if you, if you we we got that, three more meetings. We'll talk through you're it. Saying that the, you're saying that the developer should, um, should participate. Should participate. No, no, no. What I'm saying is, is the landowner and the developer, and you know, there's a whole process here, and there's a lot more than just a yes. If at face value, if you just look at it, it's the the landowner that's that's the person that's doing. But the landowner is doing it on behalf of the fact that they can sell their property to a developer because it has a contingency on the sale that says, I have to get this zoning or whatever approved prior to the sale going through. So, and that's why I use the term duplicitous. I mean, yes, it is the landowner, but what the issue here for this dispute resolution process seems to be to me is more driven out of um, density and development. And I, and I, I just want to kind of keep that, that at the forefront. And, and I appreciate it. And yeah. I'm sorry, I know that came off a little hostile. I didn't mean it to. Thank you. No, I understand. Okay, any other questions from the committee? All right. Thank you, gentlemen, thank very you, much. Chairman. I want to thank everyone for participating. We went a little over, but actually not bad. Uh, this is a, a pretty pretty uh, complex topic, and uh, and I think this is a good, uh, good start for us to begin uh, processing the information and, and going over these different avenues and, and uh, angles. Uh, would like to remind everyone our second meeting is next week. It's going to be in Cherokee County. It'll be an evening meeting. The meeting will start is six o'clock. Yes. So the meeting starts at six o'clock. Uh, the uh, information will be available on the legislative website and uh, everybody who is on our uh, mailing list, I guess we'll get an email invite to that also. Uh, members of the committee, uh, GMA has graciously provided lunch for us today. So uh, immediately following the, this meeting, we'll uh, figure out a way to get over there. Blake has directions on either walking if you want to swim or how to drive to get there. Uh, and then next week's meeting, uh, ACCG will be providing us a dinner prior to the meeting. So uh, you'll have all that information well before the meeting too. Uh, if there's nothing else, I wish everyone safe travels and uh, uh, hopefully we'll get Fred out of the way and won't have to worry about him for a while. So thank you very much. This meeting is adjourned.